Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar on MFT 101 and how organizations use it to secure sensitive files in transit, centralize administration, and automate workflows for better business efficiency. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know this event is scheduled for one hour. We are recording the event, so if you'd like to rewatch any portions or share it with a friend, you can absolutely do so. We'll email, email you a link to the recording within 24 hours. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please submit them through the questions pane in the floating control panel on your screen. We have dedicated team members online to answer questions throughout the presentation. We'll also have a Q&A time at the end of the webinar, so if you'd like to stay on the line for that and submit a question live, you can do that. And lastly, at the end of the webinar, you'll see a quick survey pop up. Please fill that out for us as it helps us understand how we did and what parts of the presentation were most helpful to you. If you have any questions that aren't answered on today's call, you can enter those there as well and someone will get back to you. So let's take a look at our agenda for today. We're going to co uh, cover the four common file transfer challenges. We'll talk about industry trends you should know. We'll get into what is MFT anyways, and talk about the top three things to look for in MFT software. Then you'll get a short intro into Go Anywhere MFT, and then we'll have our Q&A section. So today's presenter is Dan Freeman. Dan is a senior solutions consultant at Help Systems for the Go Anywhere product line. Dan has spent the last 10 years of his career in various security roles, ranging from systems engineer to security officer. As a CISSP, Dan has designed networks, systems, and procedures to ensure regulatory compliance using the NIST risk management framework and HIPAA standards. Dan, thanks for being with us today. I will let you take it from here. Awesome. Thank you for the introduction, Michelle. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep, loud and clear. All right, and thanks for all that uh, are in attendance today. Now, before we get started, I did want to share with everyone a quick anecdote of what actually happened to me just this past weekend. As you don't know, but I'm about to tell you, I happen to live next to the state penitentiary. Now, this past Saturday, I was walking my dog along the fence line and actually became witness to a prison break. In fact, I saw a man of particularly short stature climb up the fence, and as he jumped down, he sneered at me, and I couldn't help but think, well, that's a little con descending. Okay, I'll wait for the groans to stop. I think we're ready to go. All right, let's start by talking about some of the challenges we face today when trying to share information between employees, trading partners, and customers. Basically, how are we transferring files? First off, even though the proper tools have been out there for quite a while, unfortunately, a lot of IT departments are still using old technology such as FTP, legacy scripts, and PC tools, which those are either rogue installs by employees or even decisions made by staff because of the free price tag that goes along with them. And a lot of times, the older technology will be kind of a one function type tool and we end up using more than one tool to handle the different protocols or mechanisms required by our trading partners and customers. Now this can lead to a real hodgepodge decentralized solution making management almost impossible. Now take FTP. For companies that built FTP scripts in their corporate servers, and unfortunately these scripts can have many downfalls. For instance, a lot of times these scripts can be a bit complicated for the average user and thus need to be written by programmers or someone spending an awful lot of time on YouTube videos. Now, should it be the former, that can be an expensive resource. And think about how many scripts you have out there and the many different servers they're accessing. Now, think if one of those servers happens to change their URL or IP username, now you get the luxury of hunting down all those scripts where that one server needs information changed, and this could most likely be done by that same programmer and thus wasting more time and taking away from other priority projects. No bueno. Now, another problem with scripts is that your passwords potentially are stored in the clear and can make them susceptible to attack. Now, on the flip side of these complex scripts, most of the time they can be simplistic in nature and don't have advanced features like auto retry, error alerting, as well as much needed auditing capabilities. They don't take into account when transfers fail. So, what happens if the file you're expecting is not there? Or maybe the server you're trying to connect to is not available? Are you getting alerted immediately so that you can stay at the forefront and not be reactive to an upset customer who didn't receive their file? 
This alone is why a lot of folks are looking for a centralized, secure way to manage file transfers. And maybe one reason why you're sitting here today. Now let's take a look at the issues of PC tools and freeware used by a lot of employees. Most of these tools are usually a manual process, which introduces one of the biggest and most common reasons for data breaches, the human element. Making these tools prone to human error and severe risk for your network. Now what if the user downloads or uploads the wrong file? What if it contains sensitive information and the user forgot to encrypt the data before sending? What if the particular human is the only one who knows what and when to send these files to be transferred, and then they decide to be gone for the day or get hit by that proverbial bus? Moreover, with PC tools, you put sensitive data at a higher risk by downloading from a secure server environment to a non-secure managed local PC or laptop. Not to mention, there are often no logs of where the files were sent. This can be a huge problem with auditors as you can't tell what files are coming or leaving your network, especially the ones with sensitive information in them. And auditing and accountability is a huge security concern with compliance. Those auditors definitely want to know that you know what is going on with your data at all times. Now to add to these challenges, a lot of end users are still sending files through unsecured email or cloud services like Box, Dropbox without any controls or centralized management. So unless you're locking this down either by DLP content filters or application and web controls, it's very tough to prevent sensitive information from leaving the environment. And even with that in, in place, there's really no centralized auditing and control. It makes for a very disorganized and most likely non-compliant system. Now the next few slides will show some statistics from a survey we conducted showing cybersecurity trends and concerns. Here we're looking at the top five most concerning cybersecurity exploits of 2018. As you can see, unsecure file transfer did make the list. Although that would be the most obvious one in the context of the managed file transfer solutions, even number three, weak or stolen passwords, could be because of using insecure protocols like FTP during the transmission, passing those passwords in clear text. And maybe number four was system misconfigurations being caused by manual processes by untrained individuals. Automation of secure protocols and processes could prevent some of these concerns. Now looking at this slide reminds me of the constant battle between security and convenience. With over 65% claiming difficulty balancing cybersecurity controls with business efficiency shows this battle is still evident. Providing centralized automation could eliminate some of these pain points. Now couple that with insufficient skills and staffing brings automation to the forefront of these potential solutions. Not to mention that automation can greatly reduce the amount of resources needed to complete tasks, thus reducing costs and chipping away at that number three or 44% who have budgetary concerns. Here we see a few items that companies would like to implement in the next 12 months. Making the list is encrypting files in transit as well as at rest. Now, one of the items that I used to preach when I was a security and privacy officer was if you had a limited budget and weren't quite sure where to start, I always mention encrypting your data in transit and at rest is a great place to start. Now, you may not prevent the breach, but you will show due diligence that the information that was compromised is unusable and most likely will avoid hefty fines. From an access control standpoint, Multi-factor authentication, which leads the list here at 33%, should definitely be available in your solution. I can't express enough how MFA makes it really tough for someone to crack passwords or even get those pesky phishing schemes to work. Another cheap and quick way to bolster your security. And of course, being a former security and privacy trainer, it was really nice to see that folks recognize the importance of training end users on security. Now they can be your first line of defense and foot soldiers, or as we see probably too often, they can be the open doorway to the next breach. Now, I can't agree more with this next slide. As mentioned before, encrypt your data. We see that number one at 64%. It seems that most popular cloud providers are making a point to secure their infrastructure so that customers feel comfortable putting their data and systems up in the cloud. But one thing still remains. While they may be providing the hard candy shell, but once, but once they're past that, you need to make sure that there isn't a nice, soft nougat filling inside. Thus, again, not encrypting your data and making that accessible. So again, I want to reiterate one more time, 
let's encrypt that data. Here, so if we're so why are we concerned with all the security stuff? I like to think that we're just being forthright and moral folks and want to protect data, but I have a feeling these compliance regulations have a lot to do with the money going out the door to ensure data security and privacy. And as you can see here, almost three out of four folks currently have to comply with some sort of regulation. And with the, I don't want to say lenient, but kind of wide open GDPR um, uh, settings getting going, I have a feeling that number may jump up quite a bit. Now, not so much because of the companies dealing with European citizens' data, but maybe some copycat blanket privacy laws from other nations trying to go international. Who knows? Okay, so what is managed file transfer? A one quick liner can describe it as a solution that allows organizations to control and secure their file transfers through a centralized framework. Now, key points are taking all the shared, sharing of information that may, may have been done using multiple tools and getting them under one pane of glass for ease of management as well as centralized control for security and auditing purposes. Now, Managed File Transfer, or MFT for short, covers all aspects of file transfers within your enterprise and with your trading partners, including batch transfers between systems as well as ad hoc file transfers between individuals. MFT provides the automation, aka removing the error-prone hum error human element as much as possible that you need for your file transfers, protecting that data with strong NIST-approved encryption, while providing the audit trails you need for compliance with strict regulations. So what to look for in an MFT solution? Well, although there are a lot of attributes and capabilities we could evaluate here, today we'll look at three that we think are pretty important. Number one, being a sysadmin for about 15 years before coming to Help Systems, I can tell you, I can't tell you how many times I was part of the shelfware procurement process. It was either a product that one of the managers did some research on and decided it would solve all their issues without consulting those who would be managing the software, of course, or maybe a knee-jerk reaction to a compliance regulation. In any case, whatever product you buy needs to be easy to use. Ease of use will facilitate ease of adoption, not only for your end users, but also for the admins responsible for maintaining it. If your end users don't like the solution, they tend not to feel vested and go back to their old habits, and you have successfully not solved your issues. This puts you back right where you started. Now, the ease of use can also go to the sysadmin side as well. Make it easy to set up, manage, and create workflow automation to match what your business needs are without having to hire consultants from the vendor slowing things down, using up resources, and frustrating those employees. The solution must make it easy to set up new transfers in a matter of minutes, not hours or days. Not only your batch system to system transfers, but also those ad hoc transfers that are pretty popular with those one off situations. Allowing your sysadmins to pre-configure connection settings so that your users don't have to know what's going on beneath the covers, but can still kick off jobs that need to be processed is a valuable, easy to use asset. Although, also, make sure that your solution is able to interact with other servers, systems, applications, and APIs so that it can expand its capability to automate and centralize your entire business processes end-to-end. -end. This will keep management centralized and auditing and all processes funneling through your solution. Now, so security and compliance, kind of a no-brainer nowadays for any application that's part of a system on your network. The product must be able to support all the latest and pro popular protocols, cipher suites, key exchange algorithms, so that you can accommodate all your trading partners and customers first, but also be able to show your auditors that the software is able to be configured so it is compliant with whatever regulation you need to adhere to. The product must have centralized controls. It should run natively on an internal server and only be accessed by authorized administrators. Make sure that you give the solution Make sure that the solution utilizes RBAC or role-based access controls so that you can maintain job separation duties and only give right to the product that are needed depending upon the job responsibilities. Again, auditing and accountability as well as access control are two huge security concerns with auditors. So the product must have centralized audit trails on all transactions as far as file activity, user activity, and system configuration changes. And then of course, Error handling and peace of mind. Who doesn't like peace of mind? This goes hand in hand with guaranteed deliveries. 
This is very important when dealing with your customers to make sure that your solution is doing it all is doing all it can from a connection standpoint to make sure the files are delivered from built-in auto retries to getting immediate alerts if they fail so that the appropriate individuals can jump on these situations and alleviate any non-favorable results, especially in the case of maintaining SLAs with some customers. Okay, now let's take a look here, my annotation tool. Take a look a little bit at Go Anywhere and get a nice overview. This is kind of a busy slide. We'll try and keep it quick and then we'll jump more into the product in a live demo here. As mentioned here, on this side, we can access the product from anywhere. Uh, as far as getting into the administrative console, we can use a web browser, any of the popular web browsers, whether Chrome, IE, Firefox, or Opera, you can get in there. Also, you can use command line interfaces. We do have free APIs that we offer to either connect up to and do some administrative functions or actually use another application to call a project within Go Anywhere. Speaking of projects, that kind of moves over to our workflow automation. And this is kind of where we do a lot of the um, automated movement and manipulation of files once they come into or trying to leave your network. Things like encryption, whether you're doing local PGP file encryption, decryption, or digital signatures and verification, compression, as well as maybe some data translation. Uh, sometimes you might get a file of a certain type, a CSV, XML, flat file, and maybe you need to translate that to an Excel file or actually read that and insert it into a database. All those things can be done within here. We'll kind of look at this stuff when we get into the projects. As far as the projects are concerned, uh, what's very important is gonna be these samples uh, of what we call resources. Now resources are gonna be ways that we connect up to other servers and services so that we can expand the capabilities of Go Anywhere. Um, simple things like maybe we want to connect up to different network shares to actually monitor a folder location to grab files and then SFTP them out to a partner. Or vice versa, it could be a destination directory for files to, when they're coming in. Cloud services natively connect up to Amazon S3 buckets, Azure Blob Storage, very popular to maybe offset and do some archiving and cheap storage. Databases, another common feature, uh, connecting up to maybe a customer database. And maybe files aren't quite files yet, you gotta get them prepared. So we do a select statement, pull out information we want, write it to CSV, Excel, flat file, whatever the case may be, and then we PGP encrypt it and send it out the door. And vice versa, maybe you get files from folks and you need to read that CSV file and then do some insert or updating into a customer database. Lots of different resources and we'll jump in those when we get into the product. Everything like we mentioned before is very detailed audited, not only from the service uh, listeners that were listening on the server side, but also any file activity, web user activity, and any system configuration changes. We do have about 24 different canned reports that you can do in an ad hoc basis, or maybe throw them in a project, put them on a scheduled basis to send it up to your manager or the IT personnel responsible for that certain section, maybe a C-level staff member, whatever the case may be. And all that auditing and reporting is good, but if you're not getting alerted on certain things immediately, <clears throat> that's where, especially in the case of SLAs, it's nice to have those alerts to stay in the forefront of things in, in order to be non-reactive and stay in front of uh, some of those issues to get those things out the door to maintain those SLAs. All right, let's go on to the next one here. Okay, a couple more key points here. Uh, the multi-platform, Go Anywhere is OS agnostic. Now being a Java-based application, we don't get our hooks in many of the, or many of the dependencies upon the OS, thus we're able to install on virtually any platform. Windows, Linux, uh, Novell, IBM I, AIX, pretty much any platform we can install Go Anywhere on. The batch and ad hoc, now we're able to do those system to system batch transfers as well as easily set up those ad hoc transfers via an intuitive web interface, which we'll kind of demo here in a second. As mentioned, we have detailed auditing across all service listeners and protocols, file transfers, user activity, as well as system config changes. Now, one of the big reasons I really like and I think separates ourselves from MFT solutions is our interface, our UI. It's a very intuitive and easy to use, especially when it comes to the workflow automation projects you don't have to be a programmer to build out intuitive, even complex business processes to replace those old scripts. 
uh, inbound services, we do have the ability to listen on many different protocols like FTP, FTPS, SFTP, SCP, AS2, as well as an HTTPS web interface leveraging four different modules. And we'll go over those four modules in a little bit. GoAnywhere can also fulfill the encryption in transit and at rest. And we talked about kind of one of those big concerns. We want to make sure that our data is encrypted at all times. With our secure protocols and industry stranded encryption algorithms and cipher suites, we can securely transfer files. And then with our encrypted folders tool, we can target those folders for AES 256 bit encryption at rest. Now helping us along with that, we have a, we have a built in database key management system. Now this is to maintain encryption via those SSL TLS certificates, SSH keys, as well as PGP keys. All this with the ability to create straight within the product, or import existing keys for use. And also on the admin controls, kind of what we talked about, maintaining that lease privilege and job separation of duties for your administrative users. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into the live demo. Let's bounce out of here, get into here. This here, like we mentioned, this is going to be the web interface uh, that's accessible to the administrative console. Let me erase that little arrow there. <clears throat> this instance happened to be on a Linux um, cluster. You'll notice we have the IP address or host name uh, by default port 8000. Those things are configurable to you. Uh, again, I'm going to be using Chrome throughout this demo, but you can use IE Firefox or whatever browser that you want to use. So I'm going to go ahead and log in here with my admin credentials. So every single administrator, when you log in, the first thing you're gonna notice is you have a dashboard. Uh, these are pretty configurable, whether it's from the actual layout, from a one, couple flavors, a two or a three pane window, I'm using a three pane, to the actual gadget that you put on your dashboard. Uh, this can be one of 25 different gadgets uh, that you can select from, whether it's disk usage, recently blacklisted IP address, quick links, whatever the case may be, you can actually modify each individual gadget as well to be as granular or as broad as you want. And you can kind of configure these by moving them around to give it that layout that you want. Point being is, this is your one quick snapshot view of what's going on in the system at any given time. Now, speaking of admins, that's how we're logged in now. And going to the admin user roles, this is going to be the 16 different RBAC roles that we talked about to maintain that job separation of duty and least privilege. So we're not just throwing blanket admins like our product admin or in the case of Windows, say a domain administrator, we are being very granular with what the rights that that person needs to have. Okay, one of the things that we talked about on that first busy slide uh, is we talked about resources and resources being how do we connect up to or how can we leverage other servers and services? Now this expands, I guess, the the tentacles of go anywhere to be able to, to leverage those things, to move files and do file manipulation, all within this centralized environment. As you can see here, there's a lot of different resources. We definitely won't go through them all. Uh, again, a couple of popular ones that people like, the Amazon S3 buckets, blob storage. Um, here, we'll look at the database servers. We'll kind of take a peek at this one here. It's a very popular uh, resource to connect up to. So when you're going through here, um, you can just put in, we'll load the uh, most popular JD, JDBC 2.0 drivers. So you'll select the driver that is uh, what you're connecting up to, in this case, an AS400. The JDBC URL, maybe not the most intuitive thing in the world. So you can always use our wizard or get it from your DBA. Uh, but in this case, for the I series, we'll just put in the actual IP address, hit generate URL, and there it is. And you hit select there, and it'll populate that in there. And then you'll get a username and password on whatever you want this resource to have rights to. So if you want to use this in a project for writing, updating, inserting, you'll make sure that that user has that type of access. In any case, every single resource has a test button. Now this test button is really nice. It's kind of the sanity check to make sure that everything you put in works. It's going to do two things. It's going to check for network connectivity and any applicable uh, credentials that have been provided. So getting resource test successful is obviously a good sign. So now we've got that resource set up to use further down in their project. And we'll see how that works in a second. Again, a lot of other resources, network share is very popular. 
pointing to different locations within your network uh, to either pick up or drop off files or do file monitoring. Um, another one that we'll look at real quick, and the last one we'll look at is SSH servers, in particular our <clears throat> SFTP server. Uh, first tab is pretty straightforward. You're going to put an IP address or FQDN of where you're connecting up to. The port, username and password, or SSH key, whichever they're requiring for authentication, or maybe both. Uh, one key tab I'd like to look at that's not required, uh, but this gets back to we talked about those FTP scripts not having the auto retries and maybe things like that. This is where you can configure those connection retry attempts. Uh, so this, this kind of eliminates those smaller network hiccups, uh, router reboots, maybe the PC went offline for a little bit. This allows you to have some auto retries to reconnect. So one, the job actually is successful and you have reliable delivery. And two, in some cases, if you get through half a file and your retry attempt is successful, you won't have to retransmit the entire file. You can just pick up where you left off. The algorithms tab here, this is again talking about the cipher suites, key exchange algorithms, all those things that we can choose as what we want to uh, have the server support that we're connecting up to, to be as secure or less secure, I guess, as you want. All these things kind of moving over to the encryption kind of moves us to that KMS that we talked about. And just real quick to look at this, this is where you can manage your, SS, or your SSL certificates, your SSH keys and PGP keys. Again, you can create them straight from here. We won't go through that process, but you can kind of go through, select your signature algorithm, size, all that stuff. Once you do, in the case of a certificate, you can also, now that the self-signed cert, you can generate the CSR straight from here. Take that up to Thought, GoDaddy, whoever you want. Pay the bill. They'll give you a CA reply, and you can import that here, and now you have an actually signed trusted certificate ready to put on your HTTPS listener and good to go. Same thing with your PGP keys and SSH keys. Generate the key pairs, and whether you're exporting your public keys to folks or you're importing public keys, uh, depending upon if you're on the encryption or decryption side of things. Okay, so back to the resources real quick, just a recap. This is our one-time definition. What's key about that is we talked about those FTP scripts, and a lot of times you've got stuff all over the place, and a server IP address changes. It can be an administrative nightmare hunting down where that actual resource was used. Here, you just go to where you defined it here and you change it. If that, if that SFTP server was used in 100 different projects, you don't have to worry about it. It's going to go ahead and trickle on down. Okay, so let's jump into projects. Uh, first off, this folder section here with the projects, uh, think of this from, I'm going to go from a Windows standpoint, that's what I'm most familiar with. Think of this as like as a file explorer. Uh, you can create your folder structure. I would assume most of it's going to be for organizational purposes, but you can also do it from a permission perspective. Keep people in and out or give them specific rights and what they can do within the projects that are in those folders. All right, let's jump down to, and we're going to start with a simple uh, project, just so we can get uh, a little familiar with the project designer window. I'm going to go ahead and minimize these two spots here to give me a little bit more real estate. Um, within the project designer window, we do have four different windows. We've got our component library here. This is going to have about 100 or so different tasks, individual tasks, from you know some common file system tasks, copy, delete, make directories, rename, to some of the common protocols for transfer. In this particular project, we're going to look at an SFTP put. It's also some job control, if-then conditionals, some loops, things like that. Once you decide on the actual task that you want to use, that you want to leverage, you can just drag it in here, or you can double click it and it'll show up in your project outline. Your project outline is just that. It's going to go through and give you a graphical um, look at these uh, tasks that you're pulling in sequentially. So it's going to go ahead and outline this business process that you're trying to achieve and put it in sequential order of these tasks. We'll kind of go through these project module and tasks in a second. This window over here is your attribute window. I'm going to go ahead and minimize that. <clears throat> this is where, again, this is the SFTP put. Now we need to define a few things. Well, what source file am I picking up? Or maybe a variable. Where is it actually going to land? So this is just defining a few of the things that you're pulling in as far as the component library actions into your project outline. And then you have your variable section. You always have system variables available to you. 
Uh, some common ones like your system job log uh, is, is very common to attach to maybe an email that uh, if the project failed, you can send that to the individual so they can see what happened. Or even if the project was successful, you can do things like that. Okay, let's go ahead and I'm gonna minimize this one here. And let's take a look at this project. Again, this one's going to be a simple connecting up to an SFTP server, doing a put to a certain directory. Then we're going to make a copy or archive that file for our purposes in a processed or archive folder. And then we're going to delete the original file. So to make sure that we don't process that again. First thing you're going to notice is we have a project, a module, and a task uh, sections here. The project is, for the most part, your placeholder. Um, so however you're kicking off the project, which we'll talk about in a second, whether it's through a scheduler, monitor, trigger, or a CL command, uh, or an API call, whatever the case may be, the project is going to be that placeholder to do your business function, whatever you have in your modules and tasks. There are a couple global settings that you can set from the queue, job name, and maybe thread save. Now within each project, you can have multiple modules. And modules are going to be a grouping of a certain type of function or certain actions within that business function. <clears throat> within those tasks, we'll kind of go through this. You can have as many multiple tasks within a project. So for this one, let's start off here. We're going to connect up to an SFTP server. This drop down list is going to be populated by the resources that we defined just a little bit ago. So after you define the resources, then they're going to show up here. So we're going to connect up to that. SFTP server, we're going to grab this individual file, this VM Linux.csv, and we're going to go ahead and move it to this destination file, which is in the incoming folder on that SFTP server, but we're doing some name manipulation on the fly or name renaming. Instead of this name now, we're going to change it to orders and then append it with the current date. Now, this variable function is coming from, you'll notice if I click on these fields, we get this little variable function wizard. So here, this one's the current date. And you'll notice when I highlight it, we have this nice description. One thing I also would like to say, the documentation within this product is awesome. Uh, help menus in a lot of software applications, I understand I was a sysadmin for a long time. They're usually not helpful. This is actually an anomaly. This one is actually very, very helpful. So I highly encourage not only using the expression wizard, but the application help, which is this question mark over here. So it'll tell you what it's looking for and actually give you an example of what the actual output would be. So we're doing a little name changing on the fly. So now from an output variable standpoint, we can say, hey, you know what? I want to keep track of the process source files variable or the original file because that's what I'm going to archive and that's what I'm going to delete. And so we'll notice, let's highlight that. We'll see that source file over there. But just to show you kind of how that gets auto created, and this is kind of arbitrary, let's just call this processed file. So now we go to the archive task. You'll notice that change to process file. So in the archive task, which is really a copy task, what am I copying? Well, the source file is no longer going to be source file because we just changed it. It's going to be process file. And you can just drag and drop those right in there. I'm going to send it to this root directory and I'm going to call it archive test.csv. And then in my delete statement, and again, the input file variable, we're no longer going to be using source file. We're going to be using process file. Now I'm going to go back to that original file that I grabbed and go ahead and delete that. So pretty simple steps here. The one thing from an error correction or error trapping capabilities that we didn't cover, you'll notice at every level, there's an on error <clears throat> section. Now by default, if you don't define it, it will just abort the project right where it errors out. It'll be in the log file. You can look at it and go through the log. But you can do a continue. Maybe you think there's going to be, your probability there are going to be some errors, but you still want the project to continue. You can do a set var and maybe set a certain variable to a certain value, and then maybe do some conditional statements to do some further processing. Or in this case, we're going to do a call module. So in this case, at the module level, that means anything that happens in these three tasks here, if anything goes wrong, I'm going to call this errors module, which in this case is just sending an email saying project, system project name, which is one of our system variables, failed. Error message is the system job error. And then I'm going to attach the system job log, which again, we can just do that 
drag and drop right up there. Now, you can also do error modules at the task level. If you set one at the task level, it will supersede what's at the module level. So in this case, if this connect to SFTP server fails, I wanna know that specifically. So I'm gonna call SFTP error, and this is doing essentially the same thing. It's sending an email, I'm just giving a little bit more specific message. Your SFTP task failed in project, blah, blah, blah. So pretty straightforward project. I'm just going to connect up to, send a file, make a copy, delete the original. And if I get any errors, I wanna know about it. All right, let's go ahead and go to another project quick. We'll kind of kick it up a little bit here and show you, add a couple <clears throat> different features. Uh, one thing you're gonna notice is we've got a couple variables that are defined up here. These are coming from our project and our variable. So we're pulling those in. Those can be either user defined or as we call them here, project variables. These are specific to the project. Now you can give them initial values if you want, or if this is something that you know, uh, maybe an application is gonna be calling this project and you wanna pass in those as parameters. And we'll kind of show you how that works as well. But for this case, we'll just kind of go through this project to see how this works and then we'll run it, simulating it going at, uh, to where we're passing in parameters. Records found, this is saying, yep, true. Couple other things that we need to look at. We've got a create and a delete job workspace. So a lot of times when you do projects, files are gonna move, files are gonna be manipulated, file names are gonna change. Maybe there's uh, <clears throat> things that we wanna do and have it in a temporary workspace so that when we get done, we can delete that job workspace to get rid of all those things that were temporarily done in the middle of the project. That's kind of what those two tasks are for. In this task, we are going to connect up to a SQL server. This is our production 400. Again, these are gonna be uh, defined by our resources that we previously defined. We're gonna do a SQL query, grabbing looks like some employee information, and we're gonna leverage a where statement where the wages section of the SQL query is greater than or equal to that minimum salary project variable that we defined. Now we pre-populated 2,500 so I can run this natively to see the actual log file. Another thing that we need to know is everything that comes out of this select statement is going to be put in the my data output variable or row set. Another thing in the advanced, we're going to say when no data found, we're going to do a set var records found equals false, which is just another user defined or project variable that we set to true. So just saying, if nothing comes out of this select statement, let's change that to false because the very next statement, we've got an if conditional saying, hey, if records found equals true, great. Let's go ahead and do these next four steps. If it doesn't, boom, let's kick out of this project and we're done, there's nothing to process. We'll assume that there are something that comes out of um, the $25,000 minimum salary. <clears throat> You'll notice the create Excel file and that's gonna be just the uh, data translation write Excel file task. So we drag that in. What's the input to that? It's gonna be the output to that query we did earlier. So that my data, and that'll get automatically created over here. So we can just drag that in there and we're gonna put it in that temporary workspace, that system job workspace, which is equivalent to the create job workspace and call it employees.xls. We're gonna dress it up a little bit, give it a sheet name, include the column headers, yada, yada, yada. Next step is gonna be the PGP encrypt step. And again, the input file is gonna be that temporary location or the employee XLS file. Output, we're gonna keep in that temporary file. We're just gonna call it xls.pgp. And this key ID, when we hit the ellipsis, this is getting back to when we imported the actual PGP keys into the KMS that we talked about earlier. So obviously you have to do that import before that, but that's where they'd be available. Once that happens, now we're going to SFTP them. Again, you know how to connect up to those. Our source file is gonna be the output to that PGP task, which was PGP file. And we're gonna go ahead and throw it in this root D directory. If everything works out, we're gonna send out an email saying, hey, this is great. Files were sent successfully from the job name and then the file. If anything goes wrong, we're going to the problems directory. So let's go ahead and execute this file or this project, I should say. And once it gets done going, we should get a job log that we can take a peek at. 
All right, so let's go and take a look at the job log. And this is just going to be a sequential text file going all the way down to show you what actually happened throughout the actual project. First thing you need to do is that SQL query. Remember, we had that where wages equals minimum salary. We initially set it to 25,000. Looks like it pulled about 974 records. It's going to write it to Excel. Then we're going to PGP encrypt it. And one file is encrypted successfully. Then we're going to SFTP it. That was actually uploaded successfully, and then we're going to send an email letting us know that that was successful. So one thing I suppose to look at here, we can look at the email that got sent, and here we go. Looks like file was sent successfully from DB to Excel to PGP to SFTP, and it just kind of laid out the file there. So we got our email notification. Now, on the flip side, let's take these two um, user-defined or project variables, and let's simulate um, maybe a CL or another application calling this project and passing parameters at runtime. So to do that, we can execute advanced. And instead of 25,000, where we grabbed 974 records, let's try 80,000 and go ahead and execute. And the minimum salary var variable in the SQL statement should change, and I'm assuming the amount of records being pulled and written to that Excel file will change as well. So view job log, now we can see that where wages is now 80,000 instead of 25, and now we only have 385 records. Everything else is the same. PGP encrypting it, sending an email confirmation, all that good stuff. So just a couple different ways that we can write some projects uh, to get you familiar with how we do that workflow automation. Now, how do we kick these projects off? Uh, a few different ways. Um, one we can do from a scheduler. I don't want to spend too much time on this. I think these are pretty straightforward, but we do have an enterprise built-in scheduler to where you can kick these off, and you can see that all the different uh, um, intervals that you can kick these off. Uh, what's also kind of cool here is the repeat options, I think, is kind of neat. From here, uh, obviously, if, it, if the job fails, we want to repeat it for a certain amount of time, maybe every two hours and do it every 20 minutes. But we can also do things like specified conditions met. And this is where you can leverage variables, say, I don't want to kick off a job until five files are available in this folder. You can do that with this and have it check the variable, come back to make sure that it's greater than or equal to five. If so, then go ahead and kick off the project. We also do have holiday calendars, so you can define what's the holidays on your, on your work schedule and then give a conditional on if it falls on a holiday, do I do the job before, the day after, maybe I just don't do it at all. Another way we can kick off projects is going through an actual monitor. Uh, so with this here, you can always monitor local or network shares as well as FTP resources. So if you have access to FTP resources, you can monitor uh, folders for that purpose as well, instead of having to actually manually go check here and there. Uh, event types, you can see here, whether created or modified, uh, or even just a file exists. And you can do things from a wildcard standpoint or regular expression if you're regex savvy, you can do that as well. Again, you can pull this, check every, this one's doing every minute, all day, Monday through Friday, but you can decide on how often you wanna pull that folder. Key point is, once you get a hit within that monitor, it's going to go ahead and kick off a project. And by default, it builds this variable called files. And this is gonna build that file list. So if it's one, five, 10, or 100 files, doesn't matter, it's gonna pass that as a parameter into the project you're calling. So let's take an example, go back to that project, that simple SFTP put, and let's say this project is one that's actually getting called via that monitor. So instead of the source file, we're gonna do a source files variable, and now that's gonna be the files, whether it's again, one, five, 10, or 100, and then we can't do an actual individual destination file, we would do an actual directory. So drop those files off at a certain spot. And same thing with archive. The archive would be, the source would be the files, the delete would be the files variable as well, to make sure that you're not processing those files again the next time the monitor runs. All right, oh, and one other thing too with the monitor is kind of very important, actually I kind of skipped over. Uh, to make sure that you're not grabbing half-written files, uh, we do have a file lock option for OSs that support it uh, to make sure that we can grab an exclusive lock on those files. So again, we're not grabbing half-written or files that are not available yet. 
as well as if it's an FTP resource, we can do secondary snapshots, which will take a snapshot, and then about 10 seconds later, it'll take another, do some attribute comparison to make sure that we are not grabbing half-written files. All right, one of the other ways, uh, triggers, and triggers are based on, uh, solely based on web user activity, which I'm gonna move on to next. Uh, those are gonna be those users that you set up uh, to log in to go anywhere to leverage whatever services you're offering, whether it's SFTP, FTP, HTTPS, whatever the case may be. A uh, very common trigger is gonna be an upload successful to where if a file gets uploaded successfully, and we'll say it gets uploaded successfully by web user, that equals the Freeman or let's say partner A, I want to call a project or I just want to execute a native command for further processing or maybe just send an email to let you know Tom know that Dan just uploaded a file successfully. Um, not only on file things, but there's a ton of different ad, uh, sysadmin type triggers like account disabled. In case you had an SLA on a certain account, you definitely want to be on the forefront um, and know that that account got disabled to make sure that you can re-enable it or at least find out what's going on. All right, let me switch gears to the server side of things. And I'll be quick on this. These are gonna be the server things or the server protocols that we are gonna listen on and act as a server. Uh, the FTP flavors I think are pretty straightforward. Uh, you're gonna pick a port for it to listen on. Uh, in the case of SFTP, you're gonna pick a host key as well. Again, we can, we can uh, manage those within our KMS. You can develop your own S SSH keys and slap those on your server for your organizational identifier. And then HTTPS, same thing. Uh, pick a port and then put on a certificate. This kind of moves us over to our web users. I realize we're getting a little short on time here. Uh, web users, again, those are gonna be those users you're defining to connect up to go anywhere, whatever services you're offering. Uh, a couple key points. Uh, authentication uh, from a login method you can create these straight from go anywhere to where now you're using go anywhere password policies uh, but you're managing everything within go anywhere or you can do um, login methods to where you're connecting up to whatever directory service you're offering that you have on your network so that you can only manage or create users within your directory service and then depending upon how you have it synced whether it's by group membership how often you sync it, you can pull those users into Go Anywhere to have that be their login method. Authentication types, you can do this per service. So in all of them, they have some sort of, of MFA type option, whether it's using certificates and username password, or in the case of SFTP, use your SSH key as well as password. A couple other key features here, and on the features tab, this is where you're deciding what access those users have. Uh, whether they just have HTTPS, SFTP, and then the vertical column, all these features, which we'll briefly cover here, are going to be in the web console or the HTTPS web client. One of the last things we'll cover here is when they actually get access, depending upon the service, what do you want them to have access to? Uh, all these are virtual. All these here, you'll notice the uh, blob storage. So if I had set up a resource, a blob storage resource, I can now access that as a physical location for this virtual folder. Same thing with an S3 bucket. This inbound is actually pointing to a Linux mount. This encrypted file is pointing to a Windows share. You get the point. These are virtual folders where you can point them wherever you want on the back end. You can do disk quotas, and probably most importantly, you can be very granular with the permissions that they have access to. Okay, let's kick over to the web client. And let me log in as my web user account. <clears throat> Some of the features here, secure folders are start with. I think it's the most popular uh, feature that we do have. This to me, uh, in a high level, is this is your web version of a traditional FTP client, uh, except for there is no client. So what we have a lot of people um, come to us with is, hey, you know what, we've got a lot of trading partners, customers. They really either A, don't have a, IT department, two, they just don't want to maintain FTP clients for security reasons or just for the fact that their users aren't savvy enough. Uh, whatever the case may be, secure folders is a really nice option for them just to log into a web portal and then they can do things like drag and drop. And you'll see it just, it literally tells you just let go. So you can kind of drop those in there and up they go. Uh, from downloading perspective, you can download individual files or if you download more than one, it'll conveniently put that into a zip file for you. So very, very simple, easy, intuitive interface on the secure folders. 
the Go drive, uh, pretty much everything, well, it builds upon secure folders, drag and drop capabilities. This is going to be our version of like a Dropbox or box where it's on-prem. Everything within here is going to be on your back-end private network. All this information is going to be AES 256-bit encrypted at rest. Um, you have the ability to share out folders, share out files. This is where you can do that collaboration. You can maintain revision history. This is completely on the back end, um, how, how many versions you want to have. You can restore to certain revisions, or versions, I should say. Uh, trash bin, things like that. You can recover items. You can make it, hey, the trash bin is going to be available for 30 days to recover. There's also a nice uh, client piece. Uh, when you do install the client, then it's going to map a local drive, what looks to be a local drive. So if you see this employee's PDF file, if I go back here, this is bi-directional syncing. So we'll grab this employee's PDF file that looks like it's a local drive. We can delete it here. Say yes. And let's go ahead and refresh here. And you see that it went bye-bye and it should be in our little trash bin. Yep, our employee's PDF. You can always restore it if you want. And you'll get these notifications, whether email or down this lower right-hand corner, um, to see what types of actions are going on. You can always manage your manage your uh, users and the type of abilities they have. Um, secure forms. Uh, one thing quick to show: this is a web-based way, a secure web-based way to share out things either with your web users, whether via the SOAP and REST protocols for custom applications, or even out to the public. Uh, so simple things, I'll kind of show you one here. Um, point is, every single piece uh, that you build out, and this one I'm just asking for named issue operating system file upload, will be tied a variable so that when the user hits submit, it actually will be passed back to a project. And that project will be able to do whatever it is that you want to do. So in this case, this one simply is going to say, I'm going to submit this. If it's successful, I'm going to get a message back saying, thanks, your submission was delivered successfully. And the help desk user himself should actually get the actual file here, or the email. There we go. Help desk request. Attach the attachment, and then state, name a requester, what operating system, and the description of issue, which is a really terrible description there. Last but not least, on the uh, web um, features, we do have Secure Mail. Uh, Secure Mail uh, also does have not just this web interface, but we also do have an Outlook plugin, which makes things very, very convenient, as Outlook uh, seems to be the main medium for mail delivery, unless, I don't want to say unfortunately, you're on Lotus Notes. Um, in any case, uh, this provides centralized management of, cent of sensitive information. Uh, all email uh, attachments are stored on a back-end packages directory. Uh, so when you send a secure mail, it's going to strip everything off, replace it with a URL that's going to have a unique 36-byte um, identifier. And that's all that's going to be sent to the user. So when they click on that, they're going to come back into your network over the HTTPS protocol. And depending upon your protection method, whether you want them to have a password to get back in or actually register as a user, that's how they get back into the email to pull it down. So to think of that, going into a packages directory, that is going to be AES 256-bit encrypted. Now you have centralized management of all your secure information or all your email information. There's only one copy of it. So if you send it out to 100 people, it's not sending 100 copies. You're not overloading your exchange server. And file size does not matter anymore. You're not going to get that 20, 30 meg limit. That's usually about the default. So that's nice from your user's perspective to not get those undeliverable, annoying messages when they try and send large attachments. Or worse yet, from an exchange administrator standpoint, when somebody accidentally sends a 30 meg attachment to the all users group, which is about a thousand people, and your exchange administrator is pulling his hair out. So some of the advantages of using uh, uh, secure mail. Now, all these things that we just looked at, uh, so now I'm running short here, all these things that we looked at, we definitely are auditing. Does it don't say so let's kind of go through the uh https log so you'll see 1252 so just a couple minutes ago you see that d freeman logged in uh, you can see where he logged in from all those types of things what's he doing what services are, is he using uh, looks like he uploaded a file well what did he upload uh, looks like he uploaded something called chrome setup.exe that's really nice uh, what ip address did he come from when did he upload these files 
but you get the point. All these things, uh, I created a form, I uploaded a form file, submitted a form. All these things are going to be audited from web user activity, even from administrative activity. I'm sure I changed a project here during this. Yeah, so deframe and deleted project, blah, blah, blah. And this is when it shows when I did it. What did I do? When did I do it? In some case, if it's applicable, it'll show you the old value and the new value that was added. These are all broken up by service. And then also you have your file log and then your completed jobs log. This is where every single project that is run is gonna be given a unique job number for you to take a look at, should you need to. With that and the time, uh, Michelle, I'm gonna pass it back to you. Uh, pull up the page here. All right, thanks, Dan. Great presentation. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, before we get to the live Q&A, I wanted to let you know that you will be receiving an email with your free copy of the Secure Managed File Transfer 2018 Buyer's Guide, which will give you all the tools you need to find the right MFT solution for your organization. Also, as a reminder, we do have a free 30-day trial available on our website where you can download and start using Go Anywhere. So check that out if you're interested. Otherwise, please feel free to contact Dan or our team via the channels listed on your screen. We would love to talk to you. And we are going to transition now to a Q&A time where we will take your questions live. So if you've had your questions answered and want to drop off, feel free. We hope you have a great rest of the day.